When thinking of the national parks, our mind sends us on a journey to some of the most iconic vistas in America. But below the surface lies an unseen world. These are the cultural and scientific treasures that make up the underwater wonders of the national parks. The dry, dusty earth and red cliffs of the American Southwest are home to one of mankind's most remarkable examples of modern engineering. The Hoover Dam, built during the height of the Great Depression to dam the mighty Colorado River. The 60-story structure would require 21,000 people, five years, and enough concrete to pave a highway stretching from San Francisco to New York City. The project's success is responsible for creating the largest man-made water reservoir in the United States, Lake Mead. Well, Lake Mead is a 1.5 million acre National Park Service unit. It was the first national recreation area established in 1964. It's a hydroelectric plant and also it provides about 90% of the drinking water for Las Vegas. Designed primarily as a flood control mechanism and reservoir, Lake Mead's existence has been fundamental to the historical growth of the surrounding urban areas. But that's not our story. Our story rests at the bottom of the lake, where at its depth, there lies a fascinating archeological relic that is evidence to an unlikely period in American history. So Lake Mead National Recreation Area is in the heart of Cold War era development and military armaments. But not far from there is Area 51, um, Muroc Air Force Base. A lot of top secret uh, testing and, and flight instrumentation going on over you know, pre-World War II and certainly into the Cold War. The isolated desert location made it an ideal testing site for top secret government operations. During the Cold War's infancy, the United States military began test runs on a modified B-29 Superfortress. A giant of the skies. The model has seen extensive action in the Pacific theater of World War II and delivered the knockout blow from the famed Enola Gay. In 1948, with nuclear threats between the US and Russia beginning to escalate, the heavy bomber was an ideal candidate to research and field test new weapons technologies. The concept was to have a device inside the B-29 called the Sun Tracker. The Sun Tracker would measure how light passes through an optical design and where that was eventually going to lead to is missile guidance system. So it really helped develop the Sidewinder missile in particular. So on that particular day, the, the crew was flying and conducting these upper atmospheric tests. They would start at 30,000 feet, they would fly at different levels, and then finally, the chief scientist of the mission that day told the pilot to, quote, fly as low as possible. And uh, the pilot took that a little too close to heart. The flying conditions couldn't be more perfect. A beautiful, clear, calm and sunny day with minimal wind. But as the plane descended, the glass conditions from the lake's smooth surface reflected sunlight back towards the pilot's cockpit, making it extremely difficult to properly gauge altitude. To make matters worse, the plane's altimeter was not properly calibrated, rendering it useless. Traveling at speeds of 250 miles per hour, the crew wouldn't realize their mistake until it was too late. When the plane hit, it actually skimmed like a rock off the surface of the lake, and it went about another half mile, kind of pancaked over, and then settled on the lake. It lost uh, its number one and number three and number four engines on the crash. The crew was inside, there was five individuals. The five-member crew escaped from the sinking B-29 into rescue rafts. Aside from one broken arm, they would all miraculously walk away unscathed. Stranded in the lake with no superiors knowing of the crash, the crew would wait nearly four and a half hours for rescue. While the military and the National Park Service have always known about the general location of the wreck, 
it would lay undisturbed at the lake's bottom for decades, until the early 2000s, when the plane was located. Basically, the plane is intact. I mean, it suffered some damage from the actual crash, but most of the material is still there. In the early 2000s, when we were diving on the B-29, the aluminum was almost completely perfect, meaning you could read all of the tail numbers on the, on the back of the plane. You could also read at the escape hatches, the cockpit and the co-pilot's area. You could read emergency use only and the builder's plate on the number one engine that's still there, the stenciling and, and, and those types of things. The fact that it's deep and it's in fresh water means the rate of preservation is really amazing. If this had been you know, lost in the ocean, the corrosion would have been much greater. So those things that we saw in the early 2000s with the tail numbers and the stenciling on the side of the fuselage, those are no longer able to be seen. As stewards to Lake Mead and its submerged resources, the National Park Service continues to monitor and preserve the sunken B-29 bomber. During the 30-mile journey to the site, the threat of natural and man-made stressors is evident, even to the naked eye. In transiting from the Boulder Basin area up to the B-29 site, you actually pass through these narrow canyons. And one of the things that you also see becomes very apparent is the low level of the lake there. When we were on our ride up, we were uh, you know, communicating one of the park staff there that said basically the, the lake is about 140 feet less than full pool. And you really get a sense of that when you're standing alongside what's called a bathtub ring. The top of that is the original depth and the, the white is just the alkaline that's in the water here. And it's leached out onto the rocks as the water level dropped. It's about 140 feet tall, and it's been off and on since the dam was first built, but it was almost to the top of that line 15 years ago when the drought started. And it's been a fairly steady drop ever since then. 2000 was the last time we were anywhere near full pool. We were within a few feet. That's when the uh, whole southwestern drought really kicked in, and for the most part, it's been 15 very dry years. The climate is definitely changing. Whether it'll change back and to what extent, no one really knows for sure. Uh, when we first started diving it and it was close to 200 feet deep, it was a lot darker, obviously, but it was also the visibility was a lot better because of low water levels and, and historic droughts and community pressure with water needs. The lake has dropped and that's allowed more sunlight in, which has allowed this whole ecosystem of algae to bloom and, and grow and proliferate. While the water's green glow can limit the diver's visibility, there's no escaping a peculiar sight the massive colonies of quagga mussels, a pistachio-sized invasive species from the Ukraine. It was introduced to the Great Lakes in the ballast of ships entering U.S. waterways. From there, it took only one careless boater to spread the epidemic. Even here in the remote desert, miles from the nearest international shipping traffic, the problem is inescapable. We've had them here for seven years now, and the first year we actually were trying to do studies to quantify how quickly they were multiplying. They multiplied faster than we could measure them, and the, the numbers in this lake are literally in the trillions. It took them about a year to colonize the entire lake bottom. The National Park Service over the past few years have conducted a series of studies to look at the effects of these invasive quagga mussels. And what we've seen so far is the quaggas actually have a way of embedding themselves in the aluminum by eroding some of the aluminum skin. So there is some level of, of damage that the quaggas are doing, but it's not really an issue from a resource management perspective that we can address. There's no way to remove the quaggas or there's no way to keep the quaggas from growing on the plane. 
and we'll continue to monitor as the years go by the degradation of the resource or how destructive these particular quaggas are. But for now, it's just kind of a monitor and evaluate um, on an annual basis. Although the unsightly mussels have spread to the B-29, leaving blemished growths throughout its exterior, the wreck is still a breathtaking sight. And there right before you is just this big, large tail section. And, the, and it's just kind of looming up into the water column above you. In the cockpit, what you have is kind of a smashed in front from the, uh, from the actual crash. And, and the things that you see in there are exactly as they were when the crash happened in 1948. So on the co-pilot side, there is a uh, headset that the co-pilot wore is actually hanging still on the stick of the co-pilot side. It's just dangling right there. Laying between the seats is a parachute that was caught from one of the five crew members who was, uh, who was trying to get out that day. It got hung up and they managed to cut him free from it. On the pilot side, you can see the stick and you can also look at the throttle control tabs and, and how far forward they are. You get a lot of information about you know, the last seconds of the plane before they had to ditch. With lowering water levels, the public has been granted limited access to the site through guided dives with permitted companies. And the National Park Service is doing their part in preserving and protecting this historical and cultural landmark for future generations to come. The National Park Service is trying to make sure that as the site is open, so that people have the right certification levels, that they can go, they can experience the site, but they can do it safely and get a really great experience on the plane. It's part of the history of our National Park Service, part of our history here, here at Lake Mead, and part of our national history of what was going on at that particular time in the late 40s. We obviously want to protect the resource like we do with our other cultural resources, but at the same time, we really think that there's a value from an education interpretive standpoint for people to enjoy the resource. 